coming to our first Tuesday morning uh, legislative series. Uh, today we're uh, so thankful and grateful for Missy Johnson for joining us, uh, along with uh, Anne Galloway and Xavier Lynn, and they'll be having a conversation about what uh, legislative priorities may be. Uh, so in a few minutes, let's uh, welcome Mitzi and Anne and Dander. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for coming, and I will, will try to speak as loudly as we can project here. Um, so uh, the first question is, you know, we, we saw the governor in his inaugural address last week talk a lot about reversing the demographic trends that we're seeing population and workforce, and also really urge collaboration with the legislature. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm wondering how do you sort of, first of all, just responding to that speech, you know, what did you take away from it? And where do you see the biggest areas for potential collaboration between the House and the Scott administration in this session? So I was, um, I was really pleased to hear all of the signals of all of the branches being offered after the last two end of sessions that we've had. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of room for working together where, where things like workforce development, um, broadband, um, and and I think some some of the mental health issues that we face. Um, although he didn't say those specifically, I know there we started some behind the scenes conversations uh, last year about about some of the trouble we have with capacity in uh, mental health facilities. Um, so I think I think those are sort of the, the the low hanging fruit in terms of places that we can begin to, to work together. Um, I think the Appropriations Committee right now is probably like as we speak, um, uh, working on budget adjustment. And, and I think there's some good opportunity for that budget adjustment to, for, for the Appropriations Committee and the administration to sort of get back on track. So I think, I think we've got a lot of opportunities moving forward. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, we had a question this morning about how things ended up at the end of the last legislative session. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the first time in years, we had uh, a, a special session that lasted until the end of June. And one reader wanted to know um, why you allowed Tim Ash to move ahead with the deal with the governor. And then so, he claimed credit during the campaign for the use of one-time funds to pay down taxes. So Tim Ash didn't, didn't have any conversations with the governor. That was part of, you know, so I, I, I'm not sure where the reader is getting that information. Um, but, but the House was trying to come up with um, some possible solutions. Uh, the whole end of session was based on about $57 million of, of of surplus money that we thought we might get, but weren't completely sure yet. We knew some of it had come in, but we didn't know where we were going to wind up. Um, it was not money that was that we were counting on in the budget. It was extra, um, and it was mostly federal corporate tax money that was coming in uh, because of some changes and companies moving back to the United States from being offshore. Sorry. And so, and so the. The, the crux over, I mean, when you, when you really got down to sorting out where do we agree, where do we disagree between the legislature and the administration, that disagreement was, was over uh, probably a total of 30, 35 million dollars of money that came from out of state that we weren't counting on, um, that we wanted to, that all sides wanted to figure out how to use uh, to, to help Vermonters, and um, one concern was that if we used it to buy down tax rates, then tax rates would just pop back up this year, and everybody would be pretty ticked off about that. Um, and if we uh, if we used it to pay down some of our pension liabilities, it then saves money going forward in terms of uh, the interest rates that we need to pay and. Um, and the catch up that we need to do, but there's no short term benefit to that. It's not helping Vermonters right now. It's, 
it's helping the Monarchs in the future. Um, so ultimately, we split the difference um, and uh, and handed that. I mean, the legislature a couple of times passed, um, you know, passed passed budgets that said, okay, we'll give some of it to tax rates and we want some of it to go to our pension liabilities. And the governor said no, and so we said, okay, fine, we'll do a little more to tax rates and a little less to pension liabilities. And the governor still said no, and ultimately, um, you know, the signals we were getting back were just like, look. It's, it's all or nothing. Um, and so we passed what I think was a, a very good compromise that went more than halfway towards his position. And he still signaled that it wasn't good enough and he didn't sign it. So in terms of taking the credit, um, the legislature did pass the budget and did do all those things. And the, and the governor never signed the bill, so we, he, can't, he can't take much credit for it because it's not something that he, he allowed it to go into law, but didn't. And so, I, and so I think, I think that's the, you know, that's the tension and the frustration that we're really trying to get over, to have a good productive working together session this year, and and so I think um, the early conversations that the appropriations committee is having amongst themselves and the and with the administration during the budget adjustment process, with one time money because there's still some of that one time money coming in, uh, I think is a. I think bodes well. I think it's a, it's really resetting the conversation, and it's a, we're in a much more productive place. Well, thank you. I, I guess I didn't phrase the question very, part of the question very well, and so if you bear with me, the, the the first part of the question was why did you let Tim stop your deal with the governor last year? You had a deal with the governor, and then you all pulled back on the floor of the house, and I'm wondering why. So um, I wouldn't say that Tim stopped that deal okay. at all. Um, he did that. There was, uh, and and in terms of we, I had I had a I had a draft plan with the governor, and we said, yeah, we're, we're going to try to get this through. Um, but you can't have a deal if if one of the bodies that has to pass the budget, namely the Senate, isn't involved, right? You, you, it's you you can't. Um, and and the issue in trying to, I was just, I think I told you before this started that I'm, I'm up for experiments, right? This, yeah, this, this is format, this is an experiment. Um, and, and, and those conversations with the governor were, were an experiment. Like, okay, let's try to break this log jam. Let's try to do something to move this forward for Vermonters, because I think that's what Vermonters want us to do. And I think what I had, what I had underestimated was um, the very deep frustration, not from one person in the Senate, but from the entire Senate. Um, when you think about it, the Republicans in the Senate voted for the legislature's bill and against the governor. I mean, that, that is, that's profound, really, to have the governor's own party in the Senate, every single member of them, say, no, governor, we think you're off track here. Um, and push it back, and um, and conversations in the house were tense, and people were very frustrated. And so, um, so when I when I so reevaluated, when I saw that the whole Senate was against the governor and not with him across party lines, um, you know, and you look at how to pass a budget, you know, my goal is. Get the budget through. Put put a budget in place for July first. Create continuity and stability for Vermonters. Um, and the House and the Governor together cannot pass a budget. You, you only pass a budget with either the House, Senate, and the Governor, or the House and Senate, and make it make it um, palatable enough that it doesn't get vetoed. And so and so ultimately, that's. Um, you know, that's what that's what we're supposed to do because because it was it was a it was a bipartisan group of senators saying, nope, we're done. This is this is not working. We've given the governor enough, and and we need to take responsibility for some of these pension liabilities. Great, thank you. So you're you're working with um, a larger majority than you were last year, you have more Democratic members in the House. 
Um, how do you think that changes the game this year, this session? Um, and you know, now that we Republicans lost ten members and they can no longer uh, sort of automatically support the governor's vetoes, uh, how does that change things for you in terms of policy making? How do you do it? I think it's a bigger signal that Vermonters want us to be working together. They gave us they gave us divided government and rebalanced the legislative power in that. Um, because what we saw, you know, having just spent a lot of time talking about the special session, what we saw last year was the legislature passing a number of bills, a number of potential compromises, putting a number of things on the table, and the governor not coming to the table with anything. And I think, and when we did hold a, a veto override vote, um, it wasn't just Democrats that wanted to override the veto. We had, uh, we had progressives, Democrats, and we had six out of seven independents, some of whom are very moderate to conservative. And that really tells me that we were on the right track, that it was a budget that really did meet the needs of Vermonters across the political spectrum. Um, and so if we're able to craft a budget that does that, and keep in mind the budgets that got vetoed last year came out of the committee on unanimous votes and passed the floor of the House with just a few no's. A lot of Republicans had voted for essentially the same budget. So I think um, I think having having that that ability to um, to balance the power of the legislature with the power of the executive just brings the governor to the table a little, a little bit more. I, I can't tell you how many times I have heard, you know, in you know, in meetings and um, with the governor's staff, when I'd say, "What do you think of the education finance bill that's being developed? What do you think of this bail reform bill?" And I'd hear, "Well, we'll see when it gets here." Except by the time a bill has passed through the legislature and Vermonters have weighed in and it's been through those all of those negotiations. It's a little too late to weigh in at that point. The only option you have is the veto pen. Whereas, if um, you know if the administration would come to the table like every other administration, Democrat and Republican had done before, come to the table earlier and say, you know, I don't like this where this is headed. Can we can we do this instead? Great. That's that's what that's what sort of debate and crafting bills is about. So I think I think the larger majority. Um, helps the process work the way it was intended to work. Do you think you'll be able to override I hope that the larger majority gets us to a place where we're having the conversations earlier so we don't have to. Um, and I think, do you think you could? Well, the, um, that depends on the quality of the legislation, right? You, you gotta get, getting, a hundred legislators to agree on anything is not easy. Um, and so um, it's been done before. And and I want to make sure that people are really listening to each other and understanding the parameters of whatever piece of legislation um, is being developed so so that so that they understand the effect on Vermonters and they have a good sense about about how far they're willing to go to support it. But, but ultimately, my goal is to try to get the parties and the House and Senate and the two branches of government actually working together so that we don't, we don't have to use that. Okay. Um, this is a question from Eric Newley of Waterbury Center. And he asked, why do you think Vermonters can afford ever increasing taxes? Paid family leave is a good example. The cost of living is high compared with wages that you continually advocate for more tax and spend. So um, I think it's a popular line to say Democrats are the tax and spenders. But but the budgets that have come out of our, uh, you know, our Democratic majority controlled chambers the last few years um, have not had taxes and fees. We've agreed to do that. We have um, in the last, under my leadership, in the Appropriations Committee when I was there, we, a number of years in a row, cut budget growth in half 
year after year, and so so we brought budget growth down to over the period. You know, since we started that before Scott was in the governor's office, um, we brought that budget growth down to under our economic growth levels, under spend under spending growth. I mean, under revenue growth levels. Um, and and so I, I think we've done a really good job of managing money and doing things to curb spending. Um, we have also tackled some some education spending issues, um, as controversial as, as it is in a few places. Uh, Act 46, in the places where communities have chosen to merge, um, has has shown some savings. We have we recently, last year, passed a special education bill, and that's been the place that's been identified over and over by various education consultants to say that Vermont spends quite a lot of money there and doesn't necessarily spend it in the best ways. And so the new special education law that was passed last year is designed to curb spending there and help bring property tax taxes uh, well under control. Um, and I think other 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 things like affordable housing, part of the reason housing is so expensive is that we have such low vacancy rates. And so the affordable housing bond that the legislature and the governor work together on is really increasing the number of housing units available in Vermont to, to help with some of that. So I think there's been some really good work done on trying to make sure that the economy works for everybody. But well, what about paid leave? Wouldn't that increase taxes? Paid leave would carry an expense that is um, very, very minimal. And, and I would say for anybody who, when you talk about affordability, it's not, it's not the taxes you pay, it's the delta of, of your ability to pay your bills and what's left in your pocket at the end of all your bill paying. And what we're seeing right now are people who are really needing to make very difficult decisions with, with getting to work and taking care of a dying parent. <coughs> having a new baby or welcoming a new baby and and then struggling with child care. Infant child care is brutally expensive and very hard to find. <coughs> and then going back to work within a couple of weeks. Um, and so and so I I believe that the paid family leave actually helps with the affordability crisis. When you think about people, um, the people who, who who are in those positions and and their ability to balance their family's needs and their economic needs. The Senate is fast-tracking a bill that would create a legal market for cannabis. You express reservations about uh, tax and regulate for marijuana. Um, can you explain those reservations? And is there any scenario in which you would support a tax and regulate bill this session? So I haven't ruled it out entirely. We have. I'm, and the Senate passed it a number of times. Um, so, every chance they got. <laughs> um, and, and so we, um, our committees will be taking it up, um, probably after crossover, because first we want to use the, that first half of the session to get everybody up to speed and educated, all of the new members we have. Um, my concerns about tax and regulate are um, normalizing usage in a way that increases particularly youth usage, so some of those prevention issues, uh, and road safety. Those are, those are two big concerns. Now, I'm aware that um, even, you know, even in the years of complete prohibition, we were still worried about those things, and they were, they, they were still concerns. So it's not that, it's not that Total prohibition answers those questions either. Um, so, so our committees, our committees, excuse me, do, do you support a saliva test? I do. I do, and I know that part of the issue with it, though, is that and the House has passed saliva testing. We passed saliva testing last year. Mm -hmm. um, there are issues there with with uh, because of because of the way the THC is metabolized in your body. The, there isn't a test for impairment. 
it, there isn't a, a blood or saliva test for impairment. In the same way there is with alcohol. With alcohol, because of the way it's metabolized, you can you can draw good correlations between levels and and impairment. Um, and the tests aren't there yet with THC, and um, and there and there's not a clear line. So okay. there is. So it's so it's it's a little harder. So how do you address it? Well, part of the, part of the way you address it is making use of the uh, the the significant number of drug recognition experts that we have within the state police or DREs who are who go through special training to be able to test somebody's impairment because there are a lot of different ways you can be impaired on the road and some of them, some of which are are absolutely legal methods. Um, so it sounds like you basically agree with the Tennessee's <coughs> position on this issue. Would you agree with the tax commission's report that 26% is the right way to go in terms of a uh, tax level that would be appropriate to fund law enforcement and education? Or what do you think of Dick Sears' proposal for a 10% tax? I think I'm, it, I'm gonna set up our committees to, to be able to really look at that issue. Um, you. You know, you, you try to you tax it too high, and and everything's still in the underground market. Um, you tax it too low, and you don't pay for the costs that it generates. So trying to trying to find that balance is really critical. I do think that 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 moving to a tax and regulate specifically for the revenue is a bad idea. Right? You shouldn't make a decision like this based on the revenue. And and I and I, you know, the other thing I'm cautious about because my background here is budgeting. People have spent that money 17 different ways. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so you got to push the pause button on all of those pipe dreams, and uh, and and you know, come up with something that is a little more realistic. You know, the, the I think a helpful thing here is that we're not the first state. Right. Right there. This has been done. In well, what are we up to, and, and Canada, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we're up to what seven to ten mm -hmm. places to look at, and the part that you know, the part that I come back to frequently is that every other place that it's done, it's been this two-step process where the people have said we want it legalized, you know, through a referendum. Um, Vermont's not a referendum state, but another, but. And it was able to move forward in other places because it was. Right. Then when the legislature sat down to decide how should it be legalized, they all eventually decided on tax and regulate. So, uh, so we also have to sort out why, why that is. How many members of your caucus support a tax and regulate bill? I don't know yet. Okay. I don't know yet. The the um, the landscapes shifted a little bit because there were people that were that voted in favor of legalization that that wanted it legalized that were only in favor of legalizing it kind of what we call the Vermont way that basically codifies existing practice of fine if you have a small amount if you have a couple of plants we're, we're not going to bother you but it's still illegal to purchase or sell it right um, so there were some people that just wanted to legalize the Vermont way and are opposed to tax and regulate, and there are some people that voted against legalization, but they're now saying, okay, we lost that. As long as it's legal, we need to move to tax and regulate. So people are flip-flopping, you know, in terms of in terms of their sort of standard, which side of the yes or no line do they fall on? So we're trying to sort out that. Great, thank you for that. Um, this is a long question from a reader. Uh, read the burden from Springfield. She says, two employees, Mike McCarthy and Becca White, of a VPER nonprofit solar spinoff that feeds on renewable energy subsidies, plus the wife of the company's president, Carrie Dolan, now serve in the Vermont House. The company, Sun Common, of about 100 employees, now has more representation in the Vermont House than any single district in the state. Within the legislature, and with particular regard to the issue of a possible carbon tax, how widely known is this conflict of interest, and what are you going to do to ensure lack of bias and honest discussion if the issue of carbon tax comes up for debate? And follow up, are you in favor of a car 
carbon tax in any form or increasing taxes in general. Again, this is from Ritford Burton and Springfield. So we have, um, <clears throat> having a citizen legislature means that, that most legislators either are retired or have another job. I mean, so we have farmers on the Ag Committee, we have teachers or retired teachers on the uh, Education Committee, we have, we have small business owners on the Commerce Committee, and I think it's part of what helps conversations around those tables stay real, because, because you've, got, you've got people there um, who have walked the walk. And it also means that we need to, we need to be careful that, that there isn't undue influence somewhere. Um, I don't think that any of those three people that are mentioned um, are in a position to unduly influence the solar industry that Sun Common is a part of. So, so none of them are on the energy and technology committee specifically, which is where which is where renewable energy and energy policy gets discussed. Um, <coughs> even if they were having having one person there with some with some immediate knowledge, I don't think is a, is a bad thing. And for the most part, I have found. People that serve the state in the legislature very able to to, to separate some of their work life uh, and their legislative life, and we do have for cases where there is some very specific potential benefit. Um, we have something called Rule Seventy Five, where normally abstaining from a vote is not allowed, but. Um, but but you can you can claim Rule 75 when a vote is being taken just to say, look, I'm here. I'm not skipping this vote, but it's not appropriate for me to be voting on it um, because because Mason's rules, which are the parliamentary procedures that we go by, so heavily weight somebody's job to represent the people. The use of that rule is very very limited. Um, and it has to be something that is a very direct, very personal, and very individual benefit. Otherwise, none of us would ever be able to vote on something like property taxes, because we all pay them, or a budget. Um, could, could, could the House do a better job, though, of publishing conflict of interest information? <coughs> and I ask this question because we're finishing up our legislative guide, and we wanted to include the conflict of interest information, mm -hmm. but it's submitted in handwriting, and it's you know only available by PDF. And I wondered if uh, there could be some kind of commitment to uh, creating a, a form uh, that people could fill out online so that that information could be typed and readable. Is that something you'd consider? Um, yeah, we can, we can certainly look at that. Um, we also we also have to um, make sure that legislators fill it out, and yes. so compliance has been um, has been I think the most important piece of the conversation. And I found that the best way to get that to happen is to put a piece of paper on somebody's desk and say fill it out and hand it to him by the end of the day. Um, and and there. Oh. <laughs> that's my point. It's not logical. So what's the that's that's a problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to ask sure. another question? So the debate over how to fund clean water, federally mandated clean water uh, efforts, is obviously going to be continued this session, and it seems to be a, a constant uh, debate. But have you are you aware of any promising funding? Uh, mechanisms, proposals, um, is there anything at this point that you um, are willing to throw your weight behind? Or, and if not, uh, how do you see uh, lawmakers getting there this session? So the National Resources Committee and the Ways and Means Committee are going to be having this debate and, and figuring this out. We have been 
um, nibbling for a number of years, so the, so the gap is closing. Um, and there are two parts to the conversation. One is one is how to how to create that. I think there's still a little bit of debate left about exactly how much that final gap is. Um, I would like to put a little bit more uh, into that, given the needs of the lake, given the district I represent, um, and given what what clean water across the state means to our economy, our infrastructure, and, and the reason, you know, one of the reasons people move here and come here and stay here. Um, so, so the short answer is no, I don't have the silver bullet answer to that. Yeah. No per parcel fee, no estate tax, no. The question was, is there a specific proposal that I'm going to put my weight behind right now? Yeah. So, no. Um, I, we, we will be coming out of this biennium having funded water quality. I am committed to that. So um, that could be next year, is what you're saying? Well, I mean, I, I, I've been trying to get this done for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, but I, so I think, I think making sure that it, it gets done within the biennium, um, it could be this year as well. But part of, part of the hurdle here is that, is that 40, um, I mean, yeah, we have 40 new members that haven't been through a bunch of this discussion, that don't know the backgrounds and the ins and outs, and that's that's a lot of getting people up to speed that we're working on. The other, in addition to the funding, people love to ask about the funding. The other question that you guys need to focus on a lot more is, um, I realize I'm making my job a little harder and telling you this, but this is a really, really critical piece, is the mechanism to how to how to get that money from the state coffers to the projects that are gonna make a difference for water quality. Because we don't have a great mechanism for doing that yet. Um, it's not enough to just create the funding source. Um, right now, the, the multiple funding sources are the capital bill, which we funded water quality in the capital bill for as long as I've been here. And that will continue. So we have and that chunk. And that's for what particular? <coughs> so street that can be, um, yes, that can be for municipal wastewater treatment, and it's for a lot of on-farm activities as well. Things that help with required or recommended agricultural practices to help reduce, um, you know, barnyard runoff, um, keeping, keeping livestock out of waterways, uh, dealing with dealing with kind of rainwater and runoff around a barn or pasture area. Um, we funded that the capital bill for a long time and we will continue doing so. That's one piece of it. Uh, the property transfer tax, the surcharge that goes for about 10 years, that's another piece of it. The sheets, uh, which is the unclaimed nickels, which is another couple of million a year, that's another piece of it. So it's, it's great that, this, that we've got these big chunks of money already available and more will be added. But the process for, um, you know, I went on a tour a couple of years ago of Franklin County um, with, um, with a, a water quality group up there that's been doing really excellent work. And they toured us around a number of projects saying, okay, we've, we've actually gone through and done an inventory of things in the area that we can do. This company that has a lot of buses and we can grade their parking lot better and create a, a little kind of step down holding area for storm water so that things settle out and, and doesn't, the sediment doesn't run to the lake. But then how does that small local project tap into money that's available for the state? And so that's the other really big piece of this conversation. To make the money effective, you have to have a really good way of getting it out the door to say, okay, here are the first projects so that we can start by the most cost efficient projects, which is not necessarily the cheapest project, mm -hmm. but I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna know that we have a mechanism so that the first dollars going out the door are getting the most pounds of phosphorus out of our water system per, per dollar that, that we can. Great. Um, Alan uh, Willette from Stowe wants to know if the legislature will be doing anything regarding the Act 46 forced mergers early in the session. 
He says, it's pretty clear from the public record that the State Board of Education failed to properly evaluate the Section 9 proposals before making their decisions. It is also not clear that the legislature can delegate authority to dissolve school boards to the State Board of Education. Can the legislature act quickly to make the lawsuits irrelevant? I would much rather see my tax money go to educating kids than being converted into legal fees. That's Alan Gillette from Stop. Um, so he's one of the communities in the yes. lawsuit, and and the legislature, I mean, the uh, the judicial branch has now put a stay on those. So right. his community is not going to be forced into a merger until the um, until the lawsuit is resolved, and then that will help answer some of those questions. The legislature does not make it a practice to get involved with active lawsuits. Um, that's just bad form, really. Um, and so and so there there is a pause button okay. now. Um, and the um, the education committee, which has a number of new members on it, is getting up to speed with with where where we started. Um, this conversation didn't start with Act 46. It started with you know some of the regional education districts and that kind of Things a long time ago, and um, you know, and it started. It started when we, when we, when Rebecca Holcomb was running around looking at, looking at some of the educational opportunities. You know, the governor had highlighted a couple in his speech last week, which were the, the exact same list that Rebecca was talking about. Uh, the former Secretary of Education, um, exactly what she was talking about two years ago, uh, with the opportunities that kids in town A versus town B have mm -hmm. in their schools. So we're, the, the, um, you know, the goal is still to try to figure out how to make sure that the kids can have the, you know, the best possible education um, throughout the state. Um, it's 8.47, um, so I want to respect everyone's time. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Nancy, for taking yeah. your questions. Yeah, I appreciate it. Nice fun experiment. <laughs> and we'll be back. Thank you.